Hi, welcome to ECNM Tech Talk. It's a new series of how-to videos brought to you by ECNM Magazine. It's designed with a hands-on focus to share things like electrical theory and basics and proper installation techniques, all in a technical tutorial format. In other words, kind of like what we're doing right now. These videos are one of the many new benefits that are available on ECNM's members-only portal. Uh, it offers exclusive benefits, premium content, and it's, that's uh, all been hand-selected by the ECNM editorial team that put all this together. So if you're interested in finding out more, you can register at ecmweb.com in the drop-down menu under premium content. Anyway, so I'm Randy Barnett, and uh, I'm a journeyman electrician, uh, NFPA certified electrical safety compliance professional, uh, electrical trainer, electrical instructor, book author, and uh, electrical inspector. And so let's jump right in and get started with our first topic for this tech talk. And it's going to be some of the most overlooked items in the NEC. And it may not be what you're thinking of. For instance, informational notes. Sometimes we don't bother to read the informational notes. They're there because they are, uh, they're not part of the code. The informational notes are just simply there to give us some free information to help us do our jobs. You know, it's kind of interesting uh, that if you look back in the front of the code in Article 90, it tells us that the NEC, National Electrical Code, is not a manual for untrained persons. Yet, they give us about, I don't know, 1,500 or so of these informational notes that at least I was able to find. Okay? And they're, they're good free information, so not, why not take advantage of it and use it then. For instance, one of the best ones I think is at 110.12, mechanical execution of work. We all know electrical work must be done in a neat and workmanlike manner. And then that's all it says, really. It doesn't tell us how to do that. Um, you know, so I, as an electrician, I may go, I'll put, uh, oh, I'll put one receptacle at 12 inches, the next one at 18 inches, the next one at, at 23 inches up from the floor and all of that. And uh, you'd say, well, that's not good workmanlike, uh, you know, just not very professional of you and so forth. Not good execution, professional execution of your work. And that's true. It would not be. So there is a reference, an informational note then, not required, but good information for us, to help us to comply with the code found at ANSI NECA 1. Okay, so it's an ANSI approved standard and it's published by the NECA uh, National Ex Electrical Installation Standards and it's NECA standard number one and it's called Good Workmanship in Electrical Construction. So it gives us a lot more detail on how to do our electrical work in a professional manner. It gives us more details on how to support and uh, separate our conduits and so forth and in uh, conduit runs. Uh, it tells us uh, about, it answers those questions about those mounting height instructions for receptacles, switches, other devices. Also something else that that NECA 1 standard gives us that you will not find in the code is requirements for our ADA Americans with Disabilities Act guidelines is found uh, in the NECA 1 standard. So very good document. Uh, by all means, you should have a copy of that if you do electrical installation work. Now, if you're a construction electrician, you're saying, well, yeah, we, that's what we do anyway. That's how we do things, you know. We, we know what height to mount things and stuff like that. But not everybody listening here might be a construction electrician. Some are maintenance technicians, maintenance electricians, and so forth, who may not do a lot of NEC work, but when you need to, you've got to go back to the National Electrical Code and help find those answers in. Another one, uh, informational note that I think is of great value is at 310.14, specifically 310.14A3. So 310.14A3, and by the way, I hope you're either taking notes or writing things down on something or you have your code book or whatever. If not, come back and listen to it again later. But anyway, 310.14A3 has to do with the ampacities and temperature limitations on conductors then. And there are two informational notes. The first informational note explains to you, it's like a little mini tiny textbook on temperature ratings of conductors. It explains to you what affects the temperature ratings of conductors. What we have to consider when we correct for differences from the ambient temperature. Um, the second informational note then refers you back to 110.14 
110.14 is temperature limitations then on my terminations. So that's where it's going to tell you, and it actually references you to another informational note there. And the way I always explain that is any chain is only as, you know, as good as its weakest link. If I have a, uh, a conductor, and this conductor may be a number 12 THHN, and it's rated for 90 degrees C insulation then. So I can go ahead and I can push 30 amps of current flow through that copper conductor material, and at an ambient temperature of 30 degrees C, I will not overheat that insulation rated at 90 degrees C. But let's say I heat this insulation up to 90 degrees C, which is getting pretty warm. And uh, I take and I attach that conductor now to a terminal screw that's only rated for 60 degrees C. Well, that's 60 degrees C. How do I even know if that's a 60 degrees C terminal? That's back in 110.14 then, see? So my, even though my conductor is not exceeding its temperature limitation, I could overheat that terminal screw. So the reason that's all important to me is uh, because when I go back to my ampacity table at 310.16, let's say, I have to look down the 60 degrees C column and I have to limit my current flow through this conductor to 60 degrees C then, whatever it is in that column, 20 amps or whatever, so that I do not overheat that terminal screw. So informational notes can be very valuable to us, lots of good information. Now, <clears throat> the notes that appear at the end of the tables, those are not informational notes. Those are requirements of the code. I've got to pay attention to them. I've got to do what they say. For example, table 300.5 is on minimum cover requirements for underground installations. So I say, oh, my minimum cover is 24 inches, so I dig my trench 24 inches deep or whatever in this application, and I met my requirement. Not true. Because if I look at the notes down at the bottom of the table, it tells me that cover is defined from the top of the raceway cable or cable up to the top of the finished grade. That's what cover is. So I've got to pay attention to those notes. Another good one that I like is at table 31016, which is our ampacity table we were just talking about. The title, and remember that used to be table 31016, then it went to table 310.15B16, and then it went back to table 31016. But it went, it went back to table 31016 again. They took some of the information up in the title and they put it in the notes section down below at the bottom of the table. And it's very important. It tells us what the ampacities of all of those conductors listed in that table, all of those ampacities are based on a value of the conductor being at an ambient temperature of 30 degrees C, 86 Fahrenheit. Well, uh, if we're not at that ambient temperature, which we usually are not going to be, then we have to correct for differences in ambient temperature. But we wouldn't know that unless we went to the bottom of the table and read the notes in. And then remember, you've got to be careful because there are subsequent, uh, um, you know, ampacity tables in the code book after 310.16. And not all of them have that same 30 degree C ambient temperature rating. Some of them have it uh, 40 degrees C. So pay attention to the notes at the bottom of the table then. Exceptions is another error. Somewhere around over a thousand exceptions or so in the code book. A lot of them. Uh, pay attention to the exceptions. I like the exceptions a lot of times because they can help us out. They can actually make life a little bit easier for us. So, uh, for instance, um, well, I don't know, I can change the support requirements. I've got a, a piece of liquid type, right? Type LFMC, liquid type flexible metal conduit. Uh, what is that, Article 350 that's running to my motor? And normally I would have to support that within what, depending on the size, whatever, but within maybe 12 inches of that motor. But yet I'm using the liquid type because it's flexible. I want the motor to be able to vibrate. So there's an exception then that allows me that says that I, you know, I don't have to support the conduit at that distance and it gives other information as well. So anyway, uh, pay attention to your, your exceptions. They can help you a lot. Um, Another one, 430.24, talks about, you know, Article 430 is on motors. So if I'm trying to size the conductors to my motors, and 430.24 is talking about that, 
And it's talking about taking 125% of the full load of the continuous duty motors and 100% of everything else. But then there's an exception. It says, hey, if that motor is being used to supply uh, a fixed, a piece of fixed electric space heating equipment, then it references you to Article 424 for sizing those conductors in. It takes you total, uh, totally out of Article 430. Pretty important. Another one in motors, a big one that we often run into, is on disconnects. The general rule for the location of a disconnect for a motor is found at 430.102B. And it says that my disconnect must be in sight from the motor or within sight of the motor. And if I look that up back in Article 100 in my definitions, I find out that, well, basically what it means is I stand at the motor and the disconnect is no further than 50 feet away and I can see it uh, when I'm standing at the motor, there's nothing else that blocks my field of view there. So I can, which is a good safety thing, right? Because if I'm over by the motor and something's wrong with the motor, I can look, I can find a disconnect, run over there, shut the power off. That's what I want to be able to do. So, uh, but you're saying, well, now wait a minute, we've got a pretty big facility, and I know we've got disconnects for our motors. Uh, and our controllers that are more than 50 feet away from the motor. In fact, you may have to go up to the second level to get to the controller, or something like that, and you know, it, it varies, right? So there's an exception. There are actually two exceptions at 430.102B that will help you to relax that requirement if you meet certain conditions. So that's an important one for you as well. Lots of important exceptions that can help you do your work out in the field then. Uh, definitions. Let's talk about definitions. Definitions, lots of times we want, we, definitions are divided up into three parts back in Article 100. So we have part one is general information, part two is over a thousand volts, and part three addresses hazardous classified locations. So the problem is when you go and you're trying to look up a definition, look up a term, if you're not in the right part, you won't be able to find your term. So make sure that you're in the right part. Also, pay close attention to your definitions. It makes a difference on how you apply the requirements in the code. For instance, you and I might think that we know what a kitchen is. We may think that we know what a bathroom is. We might even think that we know what a dwelling unit is. Check out your definitions. You may be surprised sometime, huh? Also, another thing I like to mention is GFCIs. That's often overlooked in the code book. Ground fault circuit interrupters. Okay, they're there for personnel protection. Most of our rules for GFCIs are found in Article 210 on branch circuits, specifically 210.8, GFCI protection for personnel then. And the way that's divided up is Part A is for dwelling units, Part B is for other than dwelling units, and then there are several, several other subsections that uh, uh, you know, divide up for specific applications uh, receptacles are uh, you know, outdoors and uh, lighting outlets and crawl spaces and things like that, other GFCI requirements. But actually, you know, what's interesting, if you go back to the index, and you ought to know how to use the index, you always have to use the right term, and it's a big index. There's a lot of pages back there. But when you take a look at that index and you look up receptacles and ground fault circuit interrupters, there's actually 23, is what I count, 23 different articles to which GFCIs apply. So for instance, for Article 422 on appliances, 422.6 I believe it is, talks about other applications for GFCIs. For instance, sump pumps. Sump pumps now require GFCI protection. That's not listed back in Article 210. So pay attention to all your rules for ground fault circuit interrupters and use that index. It can be a big help to you then. Articles, just different articles in general then, you know, it's probably a good idea to periodically review uh, the articles that you uh, use throughout the, uh, your work with the code and uh, then especially pay attention to articles that you don't use that often. I'm always amazed every time I go back and read an article, I always find that there's something in there I didn't know before. I don't know who put that in there when they put it in, but I didn't think it was in there yesterday, you know. So it's a good idea to review your articles periodically and uh, just thumb through and pick out one particular article and go through and highlight some things in it. That can help you out. One article that I'd like to mention, maybe that could help some contractors, uh, if you take a look at Article 625, we know that 
electric vehicles are here, here to stay and there are going to get more and more of them. We also know that there's a challenge here in our country with the infrastructure system that we use to charge those electric vehicles. It's not what it needs to be right now to meet the upcoming needs for electric vehicles. So we've seen increased requirements by different states and uh, different locales and jurisdictions and so forth for more and more electric vehicle charging stations. In fact, we don't even call them electric vehicle charging stations anymore, really. Article 625 is titled Electric Vehicle Power Transfer Systems. So if you're a contractor, take a look at that. Part 1 will give you some general information, which is a lot of definitions, which can help you to understand the article. Part 2 is on equipment construction. It covers everything from the power supply cords to personnel protection. Part 3 is how to install these electric vehicle power transfer systems in. It covers the branch circuits, the overcurrent protection, uh, ventilation requirements, whether or not you even are required to have ventilation for a certain electric vehicle power transfer system. That's covered in part three of Article 625. And then finally, part four covers the uh, wireless power transfer equipment. So our electric vehicles, we not only charge them now, but we can also use them to supply power back into our system as well. Article 625 then. So always a good idea to go back and review those articles in your code book you know, whichever ones you want to, you pick them out, spend a little bit of time on them and, and uh, find out some more information in detail. Always new information every time you read it, right? Okay. Well, anyway, that looks like it's it for today, folks. Uh, in closing, I'd like to thank you so much for joining us for this edition of Tech Talk. It's produced by ECNM Magazine. It's part of the portfolio of Endeavor Business Media Publications. Then, uh, tune back in for the next installment where we're going to look at the ins and outs of insulation resistance testing, which is really kind of fun, and everybody should be doing it. Whether you're installing in construction, acceptance testing, or in maintenance, you need to be doing insulation resistance testing. So we'll see how it's done, uh, why we do it, what kind of results we should look for, what kind of equipment we should use, and all of those type things in our next ECNM Tech Talk then. Don't forget to check out the Members Only Portal on ECNM's website regularly for monthly things like how-to videos, uh, podcasts, other exclusive content, resources, articles, whatever, for electrical construction professionals in. Well, thanks so much for listening in today. Hope you got a little bit out of it. Have a great day. And main thing is, stay safe out there.